Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Minwi Metri. I decided, actually I struggled a bit for the past week after I volunteered to teach. What am I going to talk about? What do I really, what's, what, what's a topic that I want to share with everyone? And I had a couple of ideas, um, but it occurred to me that this is Women's History Month. Um, and there are some really important women in the history of Buddhism. Uh, and I wanted to talk about a few of them um, and to talk about what role they've had both in uh, Zen as well as um, in, in Buddhism as a whole. Um, and in the, the minds of the great thinkers. And, uh, uh, and so I'm going to start this off a little bit with a couple of quotes from Bodhidharma, because I decided, you know, we're a Zen group, we're going to talk about some Zen masters. Um, I really thought for a long time, I said, I'll talk about Visakha. She was the Buddha, uh, the Sakyamuni Buddha's greatest uh, female chief patron. Uh, and what a great story there is about her and lots of great stories from the Pali Canon about her. Um, but I decided I wanted to talk a little bit about some Zen masters, uh, early Chan masters, and how they help create um, this practice that we have today uh, that we call Zen. And I want to preface this just a little bit by telling you a quick story of modern misogyny inside Buddhism. So, oh, it's been three or four months or so, but after my wife and I moved to Texas, um, we started visiting some of the local uh, Buddhist temples around here. We were looking for a temple to uh, kind of call our own, to go and practice, build a community with, uh, you know, close to home. Um, my wife is Vietnamese, and uh, so she is um, culturally Buddhist. Um, but until about a year ago or so, she wasn't actively engaged in Buddhism. Um, the study of it, I mean. Um, so we started going around visiting some of the temples. We went to one of the temples that was actually the closest temple to our house. And um, there was a Dharma discussion going on one Sunday when we were there. And as it usually is at some of these temples we visited, it was all in Vietnamese. So I didn't understand what was going on. Um, we left after the Dharma talk was over and they did a little vegetarian lunch afterwards. And we had some good vegetarian pho. Um, and we left. And a few days later, I asked my wife, I said, so are we going to go back? And she says, no. And I said, oh, okay. It seemed like a nice temple. The people were nice. She says, they don't teach the Dharma. And I said, uh, so what happened? I said, you know, I didn't understand it. It was all in Vietnamese. She says, well, the monk who was doing the teaching had been talking about the fact that um, the women nuns and the women lay uh, followers that were there, that they needed to live a life of good karma so they could be reborn as a man so that they could become fully enlightened. And she says, I can't go back to that. And I said, I can't go back to that either. Um, so I, I tell you that story because Inside some East Asian cultures, that is not an unheard of concept. Uh, and it's a concept, as I said, based in misogyny, but it's based in a historical, social, contextual environment that is far outside of the teachings of the Buddha, or in our case, the teachings of the great minds of, uh, of Zen Buddhism. So I want to read to you a couple of passages from uh, the works of Bodhidharma first. 
And it kind of goes like this. So Bodhidharma was asked a question. If our every movement, movement or state, whenever it occurs, is the mind, why don't we see this mind when a person dies? To which Bodhidharma answered, the mind is always present. You just don't see it. But if the mind is present, why don't I see it? And Bodhidharma asks, do you ever dream? Of course. When you dream, is that you? Yes, it's me. And is what you're doing and saying different from you? No, it isn't. But if it isn't, then this body is your real body, and this real body is your mind. And this mind, though endless, oh, through endless kalpas without beginning, has never varied. It has never lived or died, appeared or disappeared, increased or decreased. It is not pure or impure, good or evil, past or future. It's not true or false. It's not male or female. It doesn't appear as a monk or as a layman, an elder or a novice, a sage or a fool, a Buddha or a mortal. It strives for no realization and suffers no karma. And then in another part of the teaching, the Zen teachings of Bodhidharma, um, he, he makes another comment along those same lines uh, about there being neither male nor female in, in the Buddha Dharma. And so it, he tells it like this. And again, it's his teachings of non-duality. So here's part of his teachings. Reality has no high or low. If you see high or low, it isn't real. A raft isn't real, but a passenger raft is. A person who rides such a raft can cross that which isn't real. That's why it's real. According to the world, there's male and female, rich and poor. According to the way, there's no male or female, no rich or poor. When the goddess realized the way, she didn't change her sex. When the stable boy awakened to the truth, he didn't change his status. Free of sex and status, they shared the same basic appearance. The goddess searched 12 years for her womanhood without success. To search 12 years for one's manhood would likewise be fruitless. The 12 years refer to the 12 entrances. So those 12 entrances that they're talking about are um, those... Um, I'm sorry, I just closed something I didn't mean to close. Uh, the 12 instances we're talking about are the 12 senses and then the 12, um, uh, the 12 parts of the body. Uh, I mean, the, the six senses and the six, um, the six senses and the six parts of the body that those senses all come through, our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, mouth, et cetera. Um, so that's what he's talking about, that that makes up those um, those things that we you know, the five, five aggregates and uh, those types of things. So he's talking about, you know, that in the Buddha Dharma, there's neither male nor female. There's neither male nor female that gives rise to someone having uh, a capability of enlightenment. And if we go back to the Pali Canon, there are, in the Kurika Nikaya, um, there are books, and in particular, I'm thinking of the Terigata which are the sayings or the writings of the elder nuns uh, or the, the bhikkhunis of the time of the Buddha. And these were all writings of the enlightened arahants um, who were females. And uh, there's lots of them, lots of great stories among those. Um, of, you might think of Ambapali. Um, you might think of... of uh, of um, the story of, of um, oh, now her, her, her slips my mind. Um, little skinny Kisa and the woman who, who died and, I mean, whose children died and the, and the Buddha sent her out looking for, um, for mustard seed uh, from, from a family who had never died, uh, who had never had anyone in their house die. Um, and so there are some great stories there um, in, the, in those women of the Pali Canon. Um, 
And then there's great stories again um, about how much um, how much Ananda had had convinced and argued with the Buddha until he was capable of of uh, convincing the Buddha to allow women to be ordained and to go forth. And so there's some great stories there. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit tonight before we get before I before I shut down for the uh, for our next meditation session. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of these great uh, Zen master women. Um, and uh, I need to pull up my notes here. If you'll bear with me just a second, I didn't mean to close my notes down. And uh, I was closing my Bodhidharma book and I dropped my notes, but. So here we go. I got them open now. So there was a Zen master who was a contemporary of Linji, um, who we know in Japanese as Rinzai. Um, but he is basically the father uh, of our form of koan practice Buddhism that we, uh, Zen Buddhism that we practice. Um, and um, so anyway, there was a contemporary of him about 800 AD or CE, if you prefer. Um, and her name was Mo Shan, um, which meant Mo Mountain. Uh, because if you might remember, the great Zen masters of old, they were usually abbots, or in her case, an abbess, uh, of a temple that was on top of a mountain. And those great Zen masters then took on the name of the mountain in which they, um, in which they led the, they were a teacher and they led that monastery or that temple. So Moshan Liaoran um, was from about 800 CE and she was a contemporary of Linji. And um, one day there was a student of Linji who came to uh, her temple. And uh, so, this the student of Linji, uh, his name was Guangxi Xian. And he had first studied with Linji, but after a while, he, he felt like he had learned what he could from Linji. And he, like many monks during early um, Chan or Zen traditions, um, he left and he went to practice uh, with another master to see if he could, you know, broaden his uh, understanding of the Dharma. And so uh, he said this, he says, uh, I received half a ladle at Father Linji's place and half a ladle at Mother Moshan's place. Since I took that drink, I've never been thirsty. And so he was one of the students of Linji who had these great things to say about Moshan. And so there's a story here that, uh, that after he had left Linji's temple, this Guangxi Xian uh, arrived at Mount Mo, and he said when he arrived, he says, if there's someone here who's worthy, I'll stay. If not, I'll overturn the meditation platform. And then he entered the hall. Well, Mo Shan had heard that this guy had showed up, uh, probably a little cocky. And so she sent her attendant out to go and meet him. And so the attendant goes to the visitor and says, um, your reverence, are you here sightseeing or have you come seeking the Buddha Dharma? To which Guangxi Xi'an said, I seek the Dharma. So Moshan sat up on the Dharma seat in the audience room and Xi'an entered in for an interview. And Moshan said to him, your reverence, where have you come from today? And he said, from the intersection of the main road well, why don't you remove your sun hat? Guangxi didn't answer for quite a while. And later, uh, he finally removed his hat and said, uh, what about Mount Mo? Again, Mount Mo was the name that they called the, this, this monk, this female monk, uh, Mo Shan. And Mo Shan said, the peak isn't revealed. Guangxi said, who is the master of Mount Mo? Mo Shan said, without form of man or woman. Guangxi shouted, 
why can't it transform itself? Moshan said, it's not a god or a demon, so how could it be something else? Guangxi then submitted to become Moshan's student, and he worked there at that temple as the head gardener for three more years. Um, I think that was an interesting story that here came a guy from Linji's temple. He thought he knew a lot, and he shows up at Moshan, and he realized, wow, she's way more in tune with her mind than I am. And he agreed to stick around for three years and be her gardener just so he could learn from her. Um, and stories like that about her went on and there were people who wrote, who wrote uh, poems about her. Uh, during the Song Dynasty, there was a writer who had written a, a poem about Moshan. Uh, and it's actually kind of a classic Zen poem called the Gunzusu Yulu. Uh, and it goes like this. Mount Mo does not reveal its pure summit, but through all time, the pinnacle it's before the eyes. It's said that it has no male or female form, but do distinguish the lotus amidst the flames. Without form, without mind, without intention, becoming male or female just accords with conditions. These times are replete with men, monks and lay practitioners. Each one shines with flawless incandescence. And I like those stories about, you know, this understanding of the Buddha Dharma. It's without identity of male or female. It's just that's the condition in which the mind is at that moment. And when the mind is freed, it is freed without form. Um, and that was the teachings of Moshan and the teaching that enlightened uh, these students of hers who came to visit her and learn from her. There's one last one I'm going to read to you or talk, tell you guys about, and then we'll, we'll close up and we'll get to our next meditation session. But there was another monk uh, about 50 years later from Moshan, uh, and her name was Mao Xin. And so there's not a whole lot known about Mao Xin, except for, like I said, she came about 50 years after the Linji period. Um, and her name, Mao Xin, means wonderful belief. Well, Lao Xin was a disciple of uh, Yang Shan Huiji. Yang Shan means young mountain again. So Yang Shan Huiji was the, the, uh, the head monk at this particular temple. Um, and Yang Shan held, her, held Mao Xin in such high regard that he made, he made her the Minister of Secular Affairs, they called it, at the monastery, which basically meant she was in charge of everything that was not the Dharma, right? So people came to visit, she housed them, she made sure there was food to eat, she made sure uh, that uh, things got paid for, that there was always incense that was bought, all those types of things. She was responsible for the administration of the temple, so to speak. So she was held in very high regard by Yang Shan, this master Yang Shan. Um, so one time, um, I, I mean, so Mao Xin is so famous that even um, Dogen had written about her in his uh, great book, Shobu Ginzo. And so here's what Dogen had to write about her. So, and this, of course, was, you know, 350 years after she existed, but Dogen had learned these stories when he had gone back to China to study. So, Dogen wrote this in the Shobo Ginza. He said, once in the late afternoon, 17 monks traveling together from Shu came to Yangshan's monastery to seek an audience with the teacher. Mao Xin greeted them and gave them a place to stay for the night um, because it was her job as the uh, Minister of Secular Affairs. They were to see Yangshan in the morning. That evening, the monks discussed how they would challenge Yang Shan to test his understanding. One suggested the well-known koan, sometimes called, not the wind, not the flag. Some of you may remember this koan yourself. That's the 29th koan, the Mumokan. This koan is about a teaching of Hui Neng, the sixth Zen patriarch. And this koan goes like this. Two monks, two monks were arguing about a flag. One said, the flag is moving. The other said, the wind is moving. Hui Nung happened to be passing by, and he told them, not the wind, not the flag, mind is moving. As the monks debated the koan, the 17 monks who had come to visit, 
Yang Shan, as they debated the koan, Mao Xin was listening from another room. How lamentable, you 17 blind donkeys, she said. How many straw sandals have you wasted? The Buddha Dharma has not yet appeared, even in your dreams. When the monks were told that Mao Xin, what Mao Xin had said, they went to her, bowed, and inquired about the Dharma. Mao Xin then said, step forward. As the 17 monks were walking toward her, Mao Xin said, it's not the wind moving. It's not the flag moving. It's not the mind moving. All the monks realized enlightenment. They thanked Mao Xin and returned to Shu without ever seeing Master Yang Shan. Um, so this is a story that Dogen said. So this was clearly a great Zen master um, in her own right. And uh, so I just wanted to share with you a couple of stories tonight about great Zen masters who were women. But it didn't matter that they were women. And it didn't matter whether Bodhidharma was male or female. Bodhidharma actually did have a Dharma heir, uh, Zongqi, who was a female monk too. Um, and so, you know, there are, there are many great stories in Zen of great, about great female uh, monks and Zen masters. Um, but the reality is the mind, when it is in its pure state, is without form. And it's without male or female, without rich or poor. And the Buddha taught these things as well when he threw the caste system away in India. When he agreed with, with Ananda to ordain women and men. Um, and so with this being uh, Women's History Month, uh, I hope you'll recognize that there are great, great women practitioners of Zen, uh, of the Buddha Dharma, and we can learn from them as well as we can learn from any other teacher. Um, don't be led into the mistakes of some of these uh, East Asian uh, temples that my wife and I stumbled across uh, that, that teach things that are far outside the Buddha Dharma. The Buddha Dharma is pure and it is pure mind. So thank you all.